Good morning, good morning. This is another uh, video coming at you from my crappy phone. This is Reese, and I'm going to do a down and dirty interview here of the Uncanny X Men 199. Now, you may notice this particular copy has been beat clean to hell, and I was actually given it free at a local used bookstore. Um, some pals of mine at the, the Prairie um, Studio here in Scottsbluff, Nebraska. I'll give away free books, and these were amongst them. And they say, hey, Reese, take all of the comics that we have here. And I said, um, okay, that's cool. And uh, this was one of them. And uh, so we've got the, the thing with Phoenix. Uncanny X-Men, this is from 1985. Uh, it is art by um, uh, John Romita and Dan Green, John Romita Jr., writing by Chris Claremont. And um, that's, the, uh, that's where we're at with here. So, real quick, going on about it, one of the things, um, the story starts off in the danger room, a standard of the, of the Claremont era, and I just want to point out the clean, action-packed um, work that just kind of flows from page to page and moves along there so quickly, um, and that's just really great. Um, in the danger room, we've got um, Wolverine and Cyclops that are talking to each other. There's some playful banter, Mariah McTaggart, is in the guest here. This is a time when Professor X was um, injured, and they're trying to figure out that's one of the subplots going on here. Now, one of the things about this comic is it is not a. Uh, those of you guys who have heard me rant about it, I love done in one. I love small contained stories. Like they're really fun. I don't mind if they tie into other stuff. This book is not one of these. It is. It is very so proper style. Where it picks up a thread here and a thread here and a thread here. There are three, three main threads in this story, um, in this issue, that flow together. And it's a very fun issue, but it's not concise. No ending in sight for these characters. The first one um, involves um, the background story where Moria, Moria McTaggart is very upset because um, Professor X did not take care of himself and he is ill. Meanwhile... When the mysterious Rachel from the alternate future is going through her own things, she'll appear again um, as things move on. Um, but there is uh, a lot of things here. And one of the other things we have is that Scott has um, just been married to, um, oh my goodness, um, Madeline Pryor. And is, Madeline is expecting Scott's child. And so that's one of the issues going on there with that. So we move from the scene of great drama um, and, and a little bit of, of action at the beginning of it. Um, and we're going to follow along ah, to Washington, D.C. Now, um, a little side note here. I'm just going to flip through it real quick. Um, uh, uh, where Valerie Cooper is met with by Valerie Cooper, who is in fact Mystique. And Mystique is wanting to... Um, Turn over New Leaf. She's tired of running from the government and says, hey, we can be an agent um, for the government, do that thing. And Valerie has her own plans about all of that. right? And that's going to set up the, the third part of the story, just a little quick aside on that. Meanwhile, um, Rachel Summers, um, who is that, who it is, um, uh, Scott and Jean's daughter from an alternate future, where the timeline is different. She somehow ended up in the Marvel Universe. Um, and is dealing with the loss of her mother after dealing with the, po the terrors in the future. And she's going through her mother's um, childhood home, and she's having all these visions of things, of her past and of the past that happened there in, in, in the 616 universe. And she, um, uh, where she was, of course, an agent of uh, a totalitarian government that was hunting down mutants. She was a hound hunting down other mutants. Um, and in her future past, and then she goes back to this other past from the other timeline and is very conflicted. And she actually manifests here in this comic, and we saw the hint on that from the suffer, the power of the phoenix. And this is where Rachel becomes a phoenix, um, and we, we see that coming on there. Um, and one of her big conflicts in this thing I, I've glazed over to earlier is she wants to connect with her alternate universe version of her father, her father is caught up on his own things. And that's pretty much where her story gets left. So we have the Professor X 
little bit there, and we have the Rachel Summers bit. That's the two bits in the story. And we're getting ready for a bit three, and we see that in this moment here is Magneto, right? And they are at this event for Holocaust survivors. Magneto is one of them. He's aged very well, and here is another um, survivor who is not aged as well, and here's uh, another uh, X-Men, Kitty Pride, who had an aunt who was uh, Holoc in the Holocaust. And so um, that's a whole storyline there going on about the relationship to all of that. And then Mystique shows up um, to try to uh, arrest a Magneto so that she can um, ingratiate herself to Valerie Cooper. But Magneto's going to have none of that, right? So then there's this fight, and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants shows up. Uh, and they're like, no, we're going to be agents of the government now. Um, you abandoned us, Magneto. Now we abandon you. That was that kind of whole thing. Um, and then there's a big fight. Don't want to get into too much of that. Side note, um, there's one of those little inserts from Mile High Comics. For any of you guys who were fans back in the day might recognize that. Then once the um, uh, Kitty Pride is actually called the X-Men, so Nightcrawler here shows up, Colossus shows up. Um, you've got um, Cyclops there in the background. Is that Wolverine also? Yeah. And um, and they, they're going to show up there to try to stop the evil mutants, thinking that they're still evil. Big fight, big fight. And um, kind of scooping along there. And eventually, Magneto decides that he is going to turn himself in. And there's this whole conflict um, because... The, um, he has, uh, he's going to turn himself in because he has terrified his fellow Holocaust survivors, uh, the Jewish, elderly Jewish folks that were there. And they're scared of him because he's doing terrorist stuff, and so he's going to go ahead and the trial of Magneto is the next big one there. So that's, uh, that's the thing. And so that's my pocket review, uh, just going through the story of X-Men uh, 199. Now, one of the fun things about this story, what I really enjoyed, was the um, uh, how, um, honestly, like it's not my biggest, fa my favorite thing, but I think that Claremont does a great job of the uh, soap opera style storytelling, where he weaves these threads throughout, but still keeps it very entertaining. There's lots of inter-character drama. There's lots of different people's motivations going on. But because of where that action is happening, where those conversations are happening, what's the thing around them, there's still a lot of, of fun that's to be had in the comic. And it keeps you interested um, in it. And even though there's no resolution, it, it points to resolution all throughout it. It's, it's a focused and directed story. And Claremont was, was excellent at it. Um, so if you find this um, for a comparable price or even more, if you are a big X-Men fan, um, I want to get one in a little bit of shape than this. I mean, I, I love these, these worn comics. Um, usually it means that someone loved them a lot and read them and read them and read them. Um, and this one, it, it also means it got um, jostled around quite a bit, but that's okay. And um, so that's, that's my review of X-Men 199. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Bye.